I'm now going to introduce our guest speakers and ask them to give a brief overview of their work. Again, please hold your questions until I open it up at the end of the panel for questions from the audience. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Michelle Wild Anderson. Michelle is Professor of Law, Robert E. Paradise Faculty Fellow for Excellence in Teaching and Research, 2014 to present, and Professor with the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, 2022 to present. Michelle is a senior fellow at Woods Institute for the Environment and a faculty affiliate Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality, Stanford Center for Comparative Studies of Race and Ethnicity, and the Program on Urban Studies. Michelle's research focuses on local government law, specifically poverty in the context of municipal governance, fiscal crisis, land ownership, just transition, and environmental justice. And Michelle has published extensively, including most recently, The Fight to Save the Town, Reimagining Discarded America, which explores government collapse in poor communities across the country. Welcome, Michelle. And I'll also introduce Scott Hunter, whom many of you know. Scott is going on his sixth year as executive director of Los Alamos Village Association. Lava was founded in the early 1960s by merchants and property owners who were concerned the opening of several regional shopping centers would lure customers away from the downtown triangle. Then, as it is today, Lava's main purpose was to promote downtown businesses via advertising promotions and special events. Scott is a board member of the Los Alamos Stage Company and a member of the New Theater Working Group. Welcome, Scott. Um, I'll begin by asking some questions to the panelists. Uh, Michelle, maybe you could start with a brief overview of your work. Thanks, Kim. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'll answer the overview of my work just to supplement Kim's great introduction by saying that I work on the kind of rebuilding of civil society that you guys represent. And I work on it in really low income areas. Um, so I say that in, as an expression of admiration for the work that you do. I see this kind of organizing effort as two things, really civil society for inclusion rather than participation in local organizing um, for, uh, for the, you know, in ways that augment our inequality problems. But I also am, I really believe that local organizing is training for democracy in general. Democracy is a practice as de Tocqueville taught us so many years ago. And this is a form of that practice. So I'm so glad to you may have frozen on us, uh, Michelle. Oh, yeah, there, I'm, you're my, back. yes, I'm sorry, my internet connection is wavering. I'm gonna cut out, I'm gonna leave it there for a moment and um, check on that, Kim. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll go to you then, Scott. I think many of us are familiar with LAVA. Please tell us a bit about it. Sure, so uh, as you mentioned, LAVA was created to, uh, so that the businesses down here could have a voice in, in the face of some of the larger shopping centers that were going in. Uh, and I think uh, that the mission, you know, hasn't, hasn't really changed except uh, the, the the face has changed. Uh, you know, downtown is, uh, it's not a, a downtown of contiguous retail anymore. It's a much more diverse uh, set of restaurants and businesses and, and uh, services. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's certainly for the better. Uh, and then lava is, you know, some things that you might not know. Uh, it, as you walk around town, we do a lot of the beautification stuff here in town. Uh, so the, the lights in the trees, the street pole banners, the a lot of the gardening that you'll see, the the flower pots and stuff is all handled uh, by lava. Uh, and I think uh, you know the rest in terms of what we do in terms of uh, promotions and marketing to bring people into the downtown to bring a hopefully a diverse group into downtown. Great. Well, thanks for all the work you're doing for the downtown, Scott. Really appreciate it. I'm going to start with a question for Scott. The past few months, we've heard from members of the community from a range of sectors about how the lack of affordable housing negatively impacts their businesses or endeavors, including Richard Drager, Drager's Markets, Duane Hurd of Starlight Caregivers, Aaron Green from the Los Alamos School District, John Cowan of El Camino Health, Erica Erickson on Child Care, Jerry Beltramo from Rustic House, uh, Randy Suda from Alta Housing and Michelle Hellman Tincher, the Housing and Neighborhood Services Manager, Mountain View. Uh, Scott, what's your sense of how the lack of affordable housing affects the business members of LAVA and the broader community and LAVA itself? Sure. So uh, you know, I'm going to go. I don't have any anything empirical. I have a lot of anecdotal evidence, but I think the biggest thing that that I see uh, on the impact is uh, some of our businesses aren't open seven days a week. Uh, and that's because they can't get the staffing. 
uh, whether that's staffing that uh, you know isn't here already or can't make the trip or is you know working closer to their own homes. Uh, that's that's really seems to be the biggest issue is uh, you know if you come to town on certain days, mostly you know earlier in the week, uh, there are, there are a number of places that aren't open because they they aren't able to uh, to draw to bring in the uh, the workers that they have. Um, and then Kim, there was a second part to that question. Oh, about other uh, you know smaller businesses or even even lava here. Uh, I'll admit I I am also an out of towner, and and based on my salary, I probably am uh, you know eligible for an affordable housing uh, if I wanted to apply for that. But uh, it, you know it is something that that I I love what I do. Uh, otherwise, I you know I might find some place that's closer to home. Uh, so I, I think the biggest impact really is that there are uh, you know workers here in town that that the businesses aren't able to to draw in uh because it is further away from from where really they are yeah yeah michelle what can you tell us about the social environmental and economic benefits to communities that provide more affordable housing thanks kim i had warned everybody before this call started that this is my one long answer because i can't answer this that quickly. Um, I'm going to try and make it as succinct as I possibly can, um, not by burying you in data, but by giving you, I think, some of the pillars to me of this answer. And there's basically three giant ones. One is the climate crisis. One is the danger of inequality to our democracy. And the third is a question of basic moral values. Um, so I want to just whip through those three pillars um, quickly. Uh, the first is that, as we all are very aware of, I think the climate crisis is here and California cannot meet our greenhouse gas emissions targets without getting down vehicle miles traveled in our big metros. These commute distances are inhumane to families and they're leading to the orphaning of children from their parents driving very long distances to low wage jobs, but they're also terrible for vehicle miles traveled and they're really unsustainable in in our uh, in our planning culture and in um, the survival of our state and our future. Um, growth. So that's the climate pillar. Number two is this income segregation and the risks to democracy. I think we are seeing a period of our history where concentrated wealth is exercising an outsized role in lawmaking, both on the very far right and on the left. And I think we're seeing the consequences of that in the um, the sort of manipulation of the American poor and the sort of what can only be described as sort of insurrectionist kind of forces on the right. But honestly, I think we have to, um, in the sort of American left, acknowledge how dangerous this level of inequality is um, to our democracy in our own ranks too. There's an incredible book whose title I think about all the time. It's written by Michael Katz. It's like 20 years old or so. Um, but the title of the book is Why Don't American Cities Burn? And I leave that, I say that title to you to really think about that, the levels of hardship that we are packing into very poor cities are inhumane, but they're also dangerous. There's a point, there's a breaking point in our education systems and our larger um, uh, culture where, um, where uh, basic sort of peace and stability are, are undermined. Um, and I think that our larger culture of churches and civic institutions um, is uh, in a period of, of transition right now in which we really need um, we need uh, income integrated spaces in civic life. We need places um, because our schools are not income integrated in the same ways that they used to be. And our, um, and we don't, we lack this sort of other apparatus of civil society. If our neighborhoods and our homes are also not integrated, um, we really are failing to do this sort of interclass communication that to me is critical to our democracy. Um, so, uh, so that's number two. The third pillar I want to do, um, you know, it's weird to talk about, or I mean, I guess it's, it's abrupt perhaps to talk about moral values, but I think sometimes we don't, we're not explicit enough about that. To me, the third pillar truly is just that it is about moral values. And I want to start this 
with a quick anecdote. Um, my husband is an architect. He does very high density housing as an aside. Um, so we see the larger politics of land use um, all the time. Um, uh, but he built a very beautiful private high school with a robotics lab and a wet art lab and a dry art lab and one incredible facility after another. I mean, just a magnificent private high school whose name I'm going to leave off the table for the moment. And in the early walkthrough before the kids moved into this high school, um, the donor parents kept coming back over and over and over to their fear that a an affordable housing development next door was a risk to the safety and security of the kids. Hmm. That was overwhelmingly the question that kept coming up on the tour was sort of, is this going to be safe? Is the affordable housing hadn't been built yet? So it was just this kind of boogeyman of sort of fear about what would happen with the juxtaposition of this super elite school and um, you know, moderate, low income, um, affordable housing. And I've thought a lot about that story. And I really challenge you to think about what people were afraid of. <clears throat> like really ask yourself, like, what is there to be afraid of? And I think I will answer, I will say on a personal level, as somebody who grew up in San Diego in the kind of culture of California secular materialism and a deep kind of consumer culture in California, I am drawn to the moral values of poor places. Poor places are not places that we have to think about um, as, uh, as sort of zones of danger. They actually, when you spend a lot of time in poor places, you become heartbroken at the load that they bear and at the, um, the incredible consequences of poverty. But so too, you, I find myself marveling, marveling constantly at the use and celebration of public space, including front stairs and parks and so forth, because people can't privatize all of that. I observe constantly intergenerational and extended family networks that really bring people together with a, a version of family values beyond the nuclear family. Um, uh, you see stories of role models of resilience and survival that really make you more confident about our ability to make it through hard times. Um, you see art and music and dance that is not about attainment and striving and status, but it is just about kind of vitality and celebration and civic life. I can't tell you how many, you know, recitals and open mic nights and other things that you get to go to um, in a place that where people can't shop their way to leisure. And that is a deeper kind of, um, you know, opportunity, I think, that people um, build in places where, you know, you can't throw around cash all the time. Um, you see uh, communities of faith and hope that have been tested. So not a blind faith or hope, but you know, hope that has been tested by serious hardship. Um, and then, uh, and last, I would just say that you see forms of interdependence that are incredibly important for, my, for us all to learn from, of families looking out for each other for child care and elder care, and um, even with cash, emergency cash assistance for one another, um, you see a kind of sharing of material goods, whether it's snow shovels or a backyard trampoline, um, because we don't all need to own, this is again my environmental commitments, we don't all need to own everything our families want to use. Um, so last, I would just say that I will, so I, again, back to this story about the private high school, I'm not sure what they were afraid of. That building was and is now occupied by teachers and nurses and firefighters, you know, public employees for the most part. Um, so particularly in that case, it's sort of confusing. There's not even a big class divide in, in some ways. Um, or not as big a class divide as I think those parents were imagining. Um, but even in some of the poorest neighborhoods in America, I think people would be surprised at how much there is to learn from and how much um, uh, just there is a role modeling of deeper material values that frankly, I think the wealthy um, white left has a lot to, uh, to learn from. So I feel like I'm the, you know, 
I'm a poverty scholar at core, um, but that's not a self-sacrificing thing. That's because I actually am really one of the most selfish scholars I know. That is a community that um, that feeds me um, in, uh, in non-material ways at all times. And I really believe that unless our intention is to all bunker up in New Zealand, you know, we are going to have to learn how to work through um, harder challenges of class and racial integration in California. Great. Thank you for such an um, informative answer. I, I'm curious, following up on that, Michelle, I've read that affordable housing is actually, having more of it is actually a win-win. Uh, and that I've read affordable housing economically benefits communities with greater tax generation, creation of jobs, opportunities for economic development, and increased job retention and productivity. Do you think that's the case? And are there other ways that uh, uh, affordable housing benefit uh, economically communities? And are there any downsides uh, economically from uh, affordable housing in communities? Yeah, I mean, this again, like, it's hard for me to answer succinctly because you captured the sort of big picture answer and it is borne out by the literature over and over again. We have, you know, 40 years of research that shows two things. One, that intense income segregation has environmental, social, and economic costs, including um, uh, I think increasingly democratic costs. So we have lots of research showing how that kind of um, intense separation um, by by class and wealth in the country is um, has uh, shown its harms. Um, and I think that we are also, you know, it's when I was in grad school for urban planning in the '90s. This is like a million years ago. There was a cascade of research showing the harms of concentrated poverty and the benefits of mixed income communities, whether it's a single building or a single block or a neighborhood or a city. That kind of mixed income environment creates pedestrian vitality that improves like eyes on the street. There's all kinds of safety implications to that kind of density and vitality, the business implications that Scott captured. Um, uh, and, um, you know, just there, there's so much uh, literature reinforcing that. So here again, I feel like I'm very sympathetic to the fact that change is hard and the housing element numbers are um, eye popping for some communities. And I, I appreciate that that is hard to assimilate and kind of imagine a rate of community change that would keep up with those numbers. So I'm very sympathetic to that, but I also really believe that um, this experiment of the last 40 years since the 1980s, when we really started intensifying this residential income segregation, have proven the dangers of, of doing anything um, that is not ambitious and, and fast. Um, so I guess, you know, you asked about the downsides and I guess, you know, at some level, integration and change are can have their speed bumps like they they can be hard for people to you know to change quickly um but i guess to that i would just say so be it because the road that we're on right now is completely unsustainable thank you scott um you said a bit about sort of anecdotal information i'm curious about another um aspect of this that came to mind. And that's, um, there are a number of vacancies downtown. Uh, and I have heard, and I'm just curious if, if you've heard the same thing, that one problem uh, filling those vacancies is that businesses thinking about coming here, uh, look around and realize that uh, there are a lot of help wanted signs. They're not, they may not be able to hire the people to run their new business here. And therefore, the vacancies persist until uh, we have a situation where there are more people uh, that could be hired and, and affordable housing could perhaps be a key to that in terms of enabling people to live closer here. Have you heard anything along that line or do you have any experience around that in downtown? 
I, I haven't heard anything along that line. First off, thank you, Michelle, for that uh, uh, description. I, I heard a lot of things I want to speak of what you spoke of. But uh, to answer Kim's question, I, you know, what I, I think that, uh, you know, that that's part of it is, you know, making sure that they can actually have, if they're going to open a shop, they can have employees. Uh, but, uh, you know, consumerism is different. And, and I, that's probably in a way that I, I differ from Michelle and that I'm I'm all for consumerism. Uh, you know, I, I want folks to come out and, and, and purchase things here in downtown. Um, but it's, you know, consumerism has changed and uh, the same type of stores that were here 20 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, even, even before I've been here six years. So, you know, within the past 10 years, uh, that that's changed. The, the idea that you have to have a, a, a shop of some sort right next to a shop of some sort right next to a shop of some sort has changed because the, the needs of the community has changed. Uh, consumerism, you know, buying stuff has shifted mostly to, or I shouldn't say mostly to online, but quite a bit to online uh, for better or worse. Uh, but that's opened up the opportunity for other businesses, other small businesses to come in, whether it's a, uh, a karate studio or something like that. Um, and in that particular case, it's usually a one or two person opportunity, or, you know, business. Uh, and so they're not out there, uh, you know, putting ads on Indeed or such. Uh, but I will admit that we just went through a change here at the office here and, and went through looking for somebody uh, by going those routes and, and we found somebody local. But the uh, point being is that it wasn't as easy as uh, as we had originally thought. We'll just you know put it out there. There's plenty of people looking for jobs. Uh, and so it, it wasn't that quick. Um, and then so back to your open storefront question, I, I think that, that that's we're looking what what is what is the new uh face of, of a downtown of of, of a, a consumer oriented area like this uh you know are there other shops are there things you know, we have a lot of unique shops and i think that's what uh what ends up being businesses that do well i mean we have a chocolate shop we have places that sell chocolate we have one chocolate shop and they're doing okay uh, you know, so those type of uh, things are, that are, could move into those open spots. I don't know if it's so much of, once again, trying to uh, find qualified workers uh, as it is trying to find the right, uh, the right mix to go into a space. Um, and then I wanted to, to mention my kind of worldview goes back to, you know, I was a uh, 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 back in the days when when desegregation was was the word, and so I you know I grew up in a in a very diverse area, went to a very diverse high school and such, and, and uh, so I you know I, I see the value overall. I still have you know friends going back that is a very diverse group of friends, uh, but the value of of having that diversity uh, it has been a benefit to me personally, and and uh, I certainly know that uh, it can benefit others and 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 benefit a downtown like ours where. Uh, you know, we have our our local customers, but we also draw people in from all around us. Uh, and I'm not just talking the the wealthy areas around us. We you know we have uh, a diverse customer base that that we've over time since we've done a lot of our promotions to bring people here have uh, have let people know that downtown Los Altos actually exists uh, and isn't under the the cone of invisibility that I think a lot of folks would love to put over it for reasons that Michelle alluded to. Yeah. And, and I suspect there are some types of consumption like the chocolate or the beer stroll that Michelle um, finds attractive. <laughs> I, I do, Kim. And yeah, Scott, I, I let me just clarify that I am certainly not against consumption. It the um, But to me, the kind of small businesses and, and commercial um, corridor that you're describing are essential to civic life. Actually, like there are forms of business and entrepreneurialism and commercial development that really give us public spaces in which to gather and have a sense of community. So I actually work really hard with poor cities about how to create what you have in Los Altos, and it's exceptionally important. So I am... 100% behind the mission of your, um, you know, your community of businesses and, um, and don't mean to push against that. Um, it's really about the, you know, about having a, a sort of mix of, of human values in a community. And to me, Amazon is not achieving the objectives that you're describing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can ask any of our small businesses and Amazon is not achieving anybody's objectives other than maybe Jeff Bezos. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it's having that community. And after coming out of COVID, uh, you know, you really see the need 
for that ev everywhere is that you know people are like i have been stuck in my house or you know i haven't gone to an event because i've uh you know i'm immunocompromised Wh whatever the, the case might be that they haven't been able to get out of the house uh anywhere that, that you can nowadays is going to be good for a community no matter where we are great um Thank you. Michelle, I, I, I mentioned earlier your new publication, The Fight to Save the Town and Reimagining Discard America. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it relates to Los Altos and the broader community? Sure. Thanks, Kim. Here is a prop. Look, I have it in front of me with my little sticker on the front. This is my copy with all my annotations of the final. Um, it, uh, so this book is about the problem of local government haves and have nots. And the very quick version of it is that since the 1980s, we have been sending less money from the federal and state governments down to um, even out the kind of revenues that local governments enjoy. And what that means is that we're getting a rising number of cities and counties in the country, and lots of them in California, where um, the uh, tax base is really, really weak because of poverty essentially all across town. And there's less money flowing in to sort of support basic services and schools and small businesses and other things that are essential to community life. Um, and the book is, is about that problem, but more importantly, it's about four really incredible, very um, high poverty places that are moving against some of the giant challenges of of this kind of concentrated poverty, um, uh, including gun violence and um, uh, housing insecurity and um, uh, the collapse in 911 services and other kinds of things that we take for granted in communities like, like Los Altos or even where I am now in my home in San Francisco. Um, so we're, you know, bought, we're hollowing out um, the, um, uh, you know, some really important fundamentals of these cities, and they are working to rebuild internally. And one of those places is Stockton, and that's important in the Bay Area because, um, because as many of you uh, know, Stockton's very low-income workforce not only fuels um, California's agricultural interior, including food that I guarantee you will eat today, whether it comes out of a can or is a meat that meat that has been processed out of the Central Valley or dairy or um, the incredible agricultural bounty of the San Joaquin Valley. Stockton is a distribution and food processing hub, and it is the home to many of our farm workers, cannery workers, slaughterhouse workers, and so forth. Um, but also Stockton's workforce is driving um, three hours round trip to reach jobs at my unit at Stanford. Um, they fuel food service and hospital work and so much of the um, basic retail in a lot of Silicon Valley, um, uh, wealthier Silicon Valley communities. Um, and uh, and those uh, commute times are an unbearable um, weight on families and on kids. Um, so I'm incredibly concerned about that that problem and the um, and the larger, as I said in the beginning, the sort of human cost of that to families and to the next generation of California um, youth, um, but also to vehicle miles traveled. Um, and so forth. So the book is really, it sits um, almost a, a quarter of the book is, is based in Stockton, um, which honestly, I will just say on an autobiographical note, was such an incredible experience. Stockton is the most diverse city in the United States of America, which actually, if you think about like how it got to be that way, that's, I mean, I tell that history in here. It's a phenomenal story of California history, of global refugee um, trails, of the gold rush, of just of, of the um, uh, exile or sort of flight from the Jim Crow South into um, California. Um, and uh, it's just this beautiful story of, of integration. And I think if we really cared about the project of, of racial integration in a country that holistically is diverse the way ours is, um, cities like Stockton have to be part of, you know, learning that that work um, and its challenges. So it was a joy to 
sit with this really important um, city that is part of the backbone of our food economy and our and our um, uh, workforce for Silicon Valley. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, Scott, we talk a lot about what solutions might uh, exist for addressing uh, some of these challenges, particularly affordable housing here. Do you have any ideas about what federal, state, or local governments could do to resolve the affordable housing problem? Well, I, I think that uh, they need to get around what Michelle's alluding to there in, in a, uh, you know, looking at affordable housing being a bunch of people that we don't want in our neighborhood. You know, I, I think that's, you know, to, to be succinct that people look at affordable housing, like Michelle's example of the private school with uh, somebody, you know, a, an affordable housing unit next to them, to them affordable housing is, is something that it brings in the bad element. Uh, and I think that, that the, the uh, you know, politicians, the city council, they, they need to get over that point of view and the citizenry needs to get over that point of view in order to be able to expand this. And I don't know that there's a solution to that, at least not one that I'm going to offer today. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I, I really think that it's uh, throwing off some of the old uh, uh, veils that we have, you know, the way that we look at society is going to need to be done at, at the uh, uh, at the government level before things actually start to happen. Great. Michelle, same uh, question. Oh, can, can I throw out one more thing? Uh, actually, Michelle, she mentioned Stockton. Uh, my family's from Stockton originally. Uh, actually, I'm from Sacramento, but uh, my grandmother's from Portugal and she went to Stockton. So you talked about people coming into that area. Um, but you, there's also something that you didn't mention. And, and, you know, I drive through there all the time on my way to, to visit family in Sacramento. And there's a lot of new housing out there. There's a lot of folks that have fled the Bay Area because there was cheaper housing out there. And to me, it doesn't look like the housing that's being built is really made for the workers that you're talking about. It's made for the folks from here that are flying away from the, the expenses of being here. Maybe they want a, a bigger house or they can't afford one in Los Altos, whatever the case might be. Uh, so I, I think that, that you know, there's plenty of, or it looks like there's a lot of housing out there, but it doesn't seem to be being built for the people that Michelle's talking about, unfortunately. Yeah, Scott, it's, um, there's no question that Stockton, like Modesto and Tracy and so many um, cities um, has, has built tons of single family housing. It's actually seeking to patch over their the budget crisis in these places by you know improving property tax revenues and really trying to sort of survive as a um, as a budgetary matter as a going concern to support local services um, single family growth like that doesn't pencil out actually so there's like bigger problems with that strategy um, but what it is is the is this key worker workforce like leaving the bay area in or the silicon valley sort of central um corridor in order to um to find housing of any kind in order to achieve the cultural you know marker of home ownership and these you know really important sort of um uh, you know, the opportunity for housing at all. So the truth is that we are driving part of our workforce. And that's why you're describing businesses that can't stay open, because at some level, people do or can't stay open seven days a week, because people are, you know, um, leaving in order to to find housing. Um, so, um, so, you know, back to Kim's sort of big picture question about, um, about uh, what else we can say about this. Um, or solutions. Um, I would, uh, here I'm gonna just uh, draw quickly from the fact that I'm a local government law professor. That's like the heart of what I do. Um, and the big question in local government law as a field is how much power should local governments have as compared to the state? That's like the heart of that whole field. And the larger housing element fights are, you know, right at the core of that issue um as as you guys you know are, i think are are immersed in um basically for for so long we have had so much deference to local autonomy and local power when it comes to land use planning and there's this point in which our state is sort of reaching a breaking point on environmental and economic um, issues and the kind of income and racial segregation that we've been talking about. And the state is clawing back some of that power, which is going on nationwide in lots of ways. 
I should show my cards and say that I believe in local power. I've always been a scholar on the side of local governments. I do not think that best case scenario, we would solve our problems by the state, you know, taking power back to the central, you know, mothership of the state capital. I believe in local democracy. I believe in local power. However, when it comes to land use planning in California, I also believe deeply in this experiment with greater centralization because the urgency is too extreme right now and the nimbiest politics have been too successful. And so until we build out a larger version of civil society like you guys, we're going to need a period of nanny state government by Sacramento because somehow we're not figuring out how to do it our own. These housing element laws have been in place since the 80s and we have not developed the larger like, um, you know, uh, accountability or um, uh, seriousness at the local level that has allowed those housing um, uh, so those housing distribution requirements to be effective. So I guess for purposes of just this historical moment that we're in right now, I feel like the state has taken power back from local governments and that is a sort of unfortunate reality for the, for the time being when it comes to affordable housing. Great, thank you. Uh, finally, Scott, is there anything else you care to say about uh, that's important and germane to this topic of affordable housing in our community. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any more than than what I've already said. I, I think that a uh, uh, you know, as I said, a, a diverse uh, clientele uh, benefits a diverse downtown, and uh, you know, affordable housing certainly uh, helps to to bring folks in who are, you know aren't buying the uh, the mansion down the street. You know, the, the folks that that uh, we need to have around to to make our culture in general uh, a, a more diverse and better place to live. Great, and, and Michelle, anything else you'd like to add? Um. No, I mean, I guess I will just, um, I will just uh, sort of end where we began that I think it's exceptionally important for, um, for people to, uh, to sort of show up for our times as, as again, as all of you are, um, by really working together um, to actually learn about the legal system governing really important issues, whether it's small business, you know, support systems and lending or affordable housing policy or um, transportation policy to support our next generation climate challenges. You know, we're at a time when I think there's needless to say a lot of work to do. Um, and we humans, we're just these tiny little ants in the colony. Like we do that work together. And I think this, this kind of um, civil society that you're building here is uh, is exceptionally important. It's a model for other groups across Silicon Valley, and so I I commend you for this. You know the practice of democracy. Thank you, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on affordable housing in our community. <clears throat> I'd like to now open it up for Q and A. So uh, those of you who are, uh, have been watching, please uh, raise your, hand, your virtual hand if you'd like to ask one question, I'll call on you. Uh, Gary Hedden. Hello. Um, one thought, I have a, a comment and then a question. Uh, and people, uh, you talk about uh, affordable housing being in a bad element or the people next to the, to the fancy new school not wanting its development built next to them. But you know, you just pick up the Chronicle every morning and there's another story about cars being broken into and no consequences, catalytic converters stolen, drug use. That's the kind of thing that is people fear. And so that's that's what we're up against there. And that has not necessarily anything to do with affordable housing. But my question then is, you mentioned Stockton, uh, both of you actually, that as an example, but Stockton is a big city. It's not something that I can wrap my head around for that would be useful for Los Altos. I would like something that's relevant to Los Altos, a, a small city, or actually I think really the answer is a neighborhood. Could be a neighborhood within a city where things are working and, and they've got all the parts working together where you can live and, and walk to the places that you need to get to. You have a park nearby and you have this, this core or little urban core within a, a larger area. I think that should be the vision we, 
we shoot for? What do you think? Do you Either. want us to just jump in, Kim? Or? Sure, sure. Yeah, that wasn't directed to anybody. So yeah. either of you. I, I'll, I'll keep a super quick thing. The, the mention of the Chronicle or just media in general, I think is really important. I think um, this is part of why I answered with um, sort of stories from my work and observing um, and working with very low income cities. The stories that we tell really matter. And the truth is that media has drifted towards stories of poor neighborhoods and poor people that really are like bullets flying and you know terrible you know um, uh, low level crimes and so forth. And really, um, I think we all with each other and you know in our community forums like media have to do more to really like notice the things that are um, are not. Um, you know, are not triggers for fear and um, and division. Oh, well, that's the, the that's narratives the we, we're up against. We, bad bad news sells. Yeah, well, also bad news is cheap. You know, this is actually something. All of my places. You know, I one of the cities in my book is Lawrence, Massachusetts, and at one point it's about forty five minutes from Boston. And at one point, Boston Magazine wrote an article calling Lawrence the most godforsaken city in the state of Massachusetts. And that, that message was so destructive. I mean, it was humiliating for the city. It was, um, you know, there's a million reasons why that was an incredibly destructive article. Um, but it was also just wrong. Actually, when you go to Lawrence and you see the kind of immigrant vitality in the city and, um, and the larger uh, values there, um, you realize that it was just false. It's a, it's, a, it's a narrative that is so incomplete that it's actually a lie. And I think that we have to resist those larger stories. So, you know, I have to say, Gary, I live in San Francisco in the Petrero Hill neighborhood. I have a 600 unit public housing development that's one and a half blocks from here. And it is one of the poorest stands of housing left in the Bay Area. And um, yeah, you you button up your catalytic converters around here, but with that proximity comes a culture of African Americans saying good morning to me on the sidewalk, which yep. doesn't happen anywhere else in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we need to sort of tell other stories too. Of like, yeah, I paid 250 bucks to have my Prius's catalytic converter pinned up. So what? My daughter has you know not just white kids in our local park and rec center, and so you know it's all about the it's all about the stories we tell. And with that, I would say that I think that um, the larger uh, densification of Mission Bay and the dog patch on Petrero Hill are an interesting thing to just you know if you go down Third Street or you you know really walk along the canals in Mission Bay. This area of the city's vibrance has gone up like orders of magnitude as it has densified. And it has changed so much since we moved here in 2008 and all for the good, um, in my opinion. So density doesn't have to be, um, you know, it doesn't have to be scary, I think. It, it brings a lot of really wonderful things with it. I was gonna actually throw in there, you know, density doesn't necessarily negate community. Uh, so Gary talked about, you know, trying to find a, a apples to apples between Los Altos and another, let's say, small town. But, uh, you know, communities, neighborhoods, like Michelle mentioned, you know, I always think of of New York. Uh, you know, if I if I want to go shopping, I usually go downstairs. I might want to, you know, go two or three blocks, but I'm going to all the things that I need are within my community right there, even though I'm in the heart of a giant city. Uh, and I, think, I love that. And you don't have to drive a car. <laughs> yeah. You, so you don't have to drive a car. Uh, and uh, and then having a Michelle talked earlier about a meeting place, you know, something that that is, you know, what communities is proud of. We've got a great, meet, you know, place down here uh, in downtown that the community is proud of. Uh, and I'm sure that the you know, larger neighborhoods or neighborhoods in larger cities uh, like San Francisco or New York are proud of uh, of the, you know, the park that's in, in their neighborhood as well. They gather the community gathering place. Yeah. Well, so my daughter, really my daughter lives in San Francisco, Lower Haight, so I, I know about these neighbors. They're they're delightful. Absolutely. So I was just going to say, it doesn't have to be a small town feel to have the type of community that you want to have a diverse community. Very good points. 
Pete, you have your hand up. <clears throat> so Michelle and, and Scott, thanks so much for talking to us about this this morning. Michelle, my question is kind of for you, uh, wondering if you have read Searching for White Topia by Rich Benjamin, uh, another Stanford scholar. He's an anthropologist there. Um, and, and what Rich talks about, and he went and, you know, he probably did several hundred interviews and lived in the communities that he's looking at. There's a, there's a, um, a trend in segregation of our communities, which is uh, um, initiated by and carried forward by white people leaving diverse communities and seeking out homogenous communities. Um, Rich talks about Coeur d'Alene and I think maybe Savannah, Georgia. There's a couple of you know cities that he went and lived in and looked at, but we can do many wonderful things. Communities of conscience, people of conscience, people of good faith can do many wonderful things, but we cannot necessarily get in the heads and change the minds of this, this uh, of the folks that are involved in this white flight that are that are choosing to self segregate and and choosing to move to homogenous communities and it does two things it makes those communities they move to very very white um, and and also brings um, politics and and attitudes that are, are are kind of associated with that but it also leaves the communities that these folks are leaving um, uh, uh, less less far less integrated and so how do how do we get how, how do we how do we attack that mindset how do we combat that yeah pete um that book sounds fascinating i actually don't know about it so i um will definitely look that up um but that phenomenon of you know the reality of white flight in our post-war period and the larger kind of seeking of of this you know sort of isolated um paradise over time is i i work with the consequences of that for all of my research i mean that the consequences of letting that go on for so many decades um are with us today and i think they're very much evidenced in the larger um rise of trump and i think they're definitely evidenced in in um the uh sort of concentration of of decline across so many communities in the country. Um, I'll just say quickly, and I could go on for such length about it, it's hard for me to even know where to start, but I'll just give you one tiny little visual for this is at a national level, a state like Pennsylvania, which unlike California has had a relatively flat population curve, people keep sprawling out to exurbs, even though the population is relatively stable. And so you get this self-fulfilling prophecy of decline in which the local, there's more local government services to provide. You know, you've got to rebuild the old infrastructure while you're laying new infrastructure. The cost to taxpayers of that are completely unsustainable. And so there's a whole fiscal conversation we could have. We can have a version of it here in California too, about how unsustainable this model of growth is. And for some people, those fiscal arguments will be more compelling at a public policy level than any kind of, you know, ethical or or moral ones. Um, and uh, you know, and then of course the larger environmental consequences of solving our problems by moving away from each other are um, are with us every day. And I guess I all I can say about it in some is that we do have to keep telling a different story. And the only answer to the kind of fear that drives white flight is not fear is like people actually being less afraid of each other and so how do you become less afraid of each other you stop indulging these kind of panic rituals in which if we you know have if you know wealthy people you know have to live next to poor people they're in danger i think you know we have to call a spade a spade and say is that is that really what's going on here and and anyway and tell tell different stories about it Great, thank you. Very, very interesting points. Sue, you have your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I actually agree with Michelle about it's too bad that the state has to take over so many things, but I'm actually pretty excited that Newsom signed AB 2097 in terms of 
minimum parking and also that he'll probably sign in 2011, which I think will make some difference in Los Altos in terms of upzoning. And um, so, I mean, I guess that brings up to me that um, I used to work for a nonprofit housing developer. And besides the concept of those people who are gonna be moving in next door, which is what you were talking about, there was always a lot of issue about property values going down because, and that's been disproved that that, you know, that that happens. And, um, and I like your idea of the, trying to promote the advantages of densification. And so I'm thinking as this could happen in Los Altos, maybe slowly, <laughs> Um, we all know that LAR and other NIMBYs were very upset about the housing element. In particular, they said we were placing a lot of low income sites in South Los Altos, which was ridiculous because anything we have that's lower income right now is on, in North Los Altos near El Camino. But I'm just wondering if you have ideas about how we do sort of frame this differently to persuade people. I mean, I don't know that they're going to read studies or, you know, do people write letters to the editor about things or what do we do to change the minds, I guess? You know, Susan, I mean, here too, I just want to say that you guys are, are figuring it out. I mean, just if we all sit here and we rewind 10 years, we know that there was no YIMBY level street game. There's no organizing around YIMBY movement. There wasn't, you know, outpourings of people in favor of projects. And you know, I mentioned before, and that's different now. And how did that happen? That happened because people like you actually built that kind of, you know, that um, the social networks required to get news out about public hearings and turn out, yes, constituencies. And I just think that's so important. And I will say, my, you know, as I mentioned, my spouse um, is an architect and has a project right now in Oakland. And just two nights ago, we had this or I listened to a public hearing related to the permitting on this high, very high density project, market rate housing with an affordable component, but um, nonetheless, just outpouring. And it was amazing Then you know, the NIMBY speakers were out in droves, but so were the 20 somethings. And so were the sort of retirees who want a pedestrian fabric and want to be able to support Scott's business life so that they don't have to be in their cars when they're 80. And the larger conversation was, it could not have happened. I don't even think it could have happened five years ago. And so, you know, the, the developer and the, you know, architects and everybody, you know, at some level, it was painful for them, like it's painful to have the sort of NIMBY outpouring, but then to sort of have the community sort of have your back and to have sort of disseminated news of this, it's, it's, um, it's very impressive. Um, and the thing is that you're describing these larger or these more micro points about North versus South and El Camino and where and these, you know, the local local people have to be involved in that. I mean, what does Sacramento know about where housing should be in Los Altos? You know, nothing. So that, you know, really having a diverse group of people at the table, like really leaning into those problems, working together, um, you know, and to have pro-housing communities, um, you know, at the table, but also with the community's best interests in mind and, you know, not just a kind of, um, you know, um, I don't know, not a, you know, centralized vision for how to achieve these numbers goals. It's the whole design of the housing element program, which was always, in my opinion, the, the only way to, um, to achieve the integration of affordable housing. So I, I think we're at an exciting time and maybe this new housing element round, um, will, will show those kinds of returns statewide. And, you know, and then local governments, I mean, this is totally Pollyanna, but at that point, you know, once a larger democratic apparatus of really working on these issues and caring about them has been built, then the state can kind of pull back a little bit and let community members, you know, run these difficult decisions themselves. Joe, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, Michelle, I had a question for you. We've, we've suffered from, uh, I think, various speakers have alluded to the uh, disinformation campaigns that have occurred on various topics, whether it's housing or natural gas bans or other things recently. Um, have you seen tools and, and processes that are effective in 
fighting these sorts of disinformation campaigns that are springing up at the local levels? Um, I know it may not be your area of expertise, but I can imagine like with the school that your husband, you know, put in that sometimes these uh, facts don't come out correct and uh, would love your thoughts on it. Yeah, it's, it's really important. I think, um, you know, this is just like my answer to the last question. I think you fight misinformation with other information. And so you've got to have the social networks built that disseminate accurate facts. And so to me, again, this is like goes back to like the heartland tool here has to be building connective tissue among <laughs> residents to sort of turn them out for public hearings and to correct falsehoods. And, you know, it's, it's um, there's a larger news um, sort of phenomenon going on in the country right now, which you guys are, you know, probably aware of, which is that the internet age of information means that we're no longer exposed to a full cross section of news. Um, so, you know, we used to have to flip headlines. And so you knew what was going on in Burma Bay and the sports page, even if you didn't equally care about those two things, um, because you flipped headlines. But in the internet age, you know, so much of our sources of news are cultivated based on our preferences. So that's going on sort of in the larger sort of access to information, but then local newspapers are an important exception to that because they are, you know, um, these, uh, they actually still have strong readerships. They have no, um, you know, they're really important backbones. And for a long time, local newspapers in California in particular, I think, but maybe elsewhere, have been dominated by anti-housing interests. And so the truth is that a lot of the kind of neighborhood, you know, homeowners associations were the backbone sort of writers and opinion writers and so forth for those local news bulletins. And so again, like here, it's all just about, um, you know, being part of those institutions, changing them, you know, having Scott on the op-ed page, not just, you know, somebody who is, um, you know, worried about, I don't know, whatever. Um, so it it is a it's a it's a matter of, of participation and and alternatives. And unfortunately, um, because I've you know again worked so many years in Stockton, I've seen the there is a real danger of fake news in the local context, just like in the national one. And so this is a a real issue, and um, and we have to work on you know, Stockton's got to rebuild the Stockton record and really rebuild the kind of local newsrooms that can get real information out to people. So that to the first point, you know, everything that the local newsrooms publishes is not just, you know, bullets flying and, you know, opposition to density. Great. Thank you. Um, we're a little after 930. <clears throat> I don't know if, if Scott, you and Michelle can stick around in case there are more questions. I, I want to note where we are in case anybody needs to leave at this point. Um, but uh, I have sort of one thought. I'm curious about your, your take on this. I'm kind of a pathological optimist. And so um, I think actually the, the new approach with the housing element <clears throat> is, is making people in communities talk to each other about affordable housing because it basically has a provision if the local government doesn't figure it out, the state may just step in and cram down what they think is good for the local community, which as you noted, is not likely to be very satisfying at all. Uh, and so I think I, I've noticed, it seems like some of the YIMBYs or NIMBYs rather, are beginning to say, okay, yeah, we do need a housing element because they're they're fearful of what the state might do if we don't come up with something. Do you, do you notice that at all happening? Um, I don't think that's pathologically optimistic. I think that's exactly right. I think it's by design. And, you know, to be clear, the big hammer that this housing element has is not that Sacramento is going to write the maps. It's that developers will get to, you know, override essentially the zoning laws. And so it is, it's, it's using private developers as a substitute for local planning or sort of a threat to um, local planning. So I, it's by design and, and yes, it is scary and it should be scary. And I think it is having exactly the effect you describe, which is that people are being forced to, to really think about where the density is gonna go as opposed to if there should be any level of density. And I think we're, 
bound to see fewer shenanigans statewide where, you know, towns are up zoning cemeteries and, you know, things that are, you know, back in the, in the, um, a uh, very famous Mount Laurel um, decision in New Jersey, which spawned, you know, 40 years of litigation and legislation that is the origin, Mount Laurel back in legal history is the origin for all of these housing element kind of um, legal structures and all in inclusionary zoning and so forth. Um, and, uh, and back in that period, you know, Mount Laurel, the town, the suburban town outside of Camden, New Jersey, was, you know, put in contempt of court constantly for those things. Like, you're going to upzone a wetland? You know, great. Thank you very much. Like, it was seen as just openly nullifying the law, defiant of the court, and so forth. And unfortunately, I think HCD has kind of allowed that kind of nullification for a long time just because it was administratively weak. And there was no contempt of court sanction for it. So it just kind of went on. And I think, you know, people have figured out a, a hammer. And I, I think that hammer's really ugly. I don't think developers should get to do whatever they want, but it in the maybe it'll elicit the kind of sort of forced cooperation that you're describing. Great. Thank you. I don't well, see and I wanted to say, you know, talking about, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but in terms of political discourse, obviously the past five, six years have changed a lot of the way uh, people think about, uh, you know, politics or think about a, a um, an issue in their community. So rather than it be a, uh, you know, okay, well, that's, that's a good part of that, but I don't like this other part. It's like, I hate all of it because I don't like this one part. And you've got this, you know, fighting going on. And I think that the only thing that's going to change there is uh you know bringing in new uh new government representatives uh that understand that there is a give and take for things i mean i think kim's dad's probably spinning in his grave over the way things that are go on in washington nowadays uh you know because even though he was very much on the the left side of things uh he knew how to to work back and forth between the other uh, across the aisle and i we've lost that not just in politics but in 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 life in our community to where it's an us versus them kind of thing. And it really shouldn't be that. Like I said, I think I'm preaching the choir with this particular group. Hopefully some of the non-choir will watch the YouTube video. So M Michelle, uh, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. This has been a very thought provoking uh, discussion. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, taking a bit of your time to uh, engage in this conversation. I want to let people know as I wrap up here, our next meeting will be 8.30, 9.30 a.m. Friday, October 7th on Reach Codes, A Better Understanding with Don Whedon, Environmental Commissioner, Reach Codes Subcommittee Member, City of Los Altos, and John Lurch, Owner Operator of Lurch Construction. Uh, if you'd like to be added to the uh, LAC email list, uh, I think somebody is posting in chat right now where you can send an email to be added to it. Um, I want to give a big thank you to Los Aldos Mountain View Community Foundation providing the Community Coalition with financial and in-kind support. And we also want to express our deep appreciation to Larry Barron, who uh, does a great deal to uh, get uh, our videos up onto uh, YouTube. So Larry, thank you so much for your help with that. And that's it. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been very, very fascinating conversation, very informative. Uh, so glad to be here. Thank you, Kim. I'm going to stay and read the chat for a minute because there's some good stuff on there that I missed.